welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and again the fabulous Christopher. Chris, who have we got on today? This one's quite an interesting one. Uh, We have Natalie Holt, who is a historian, best-selling author of the book Rocket Girls and of Queens of Animation. And she's here to talk to us about her new book and Radio 4 book of the week from 30th of January, Wise Girls, which is about uh, women in the CIA post-Second World War. So uh, Natalie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited because uh, I just mentioned before we started recording that I've been uh, watching Quantico and, you know, the, the second season, you end up doing like CAA stuff. And so I feel like it's all this spy stuff and I love spy stuff and our listeners love spy stuff as well. So I'm not the only one, but we're doing women in spy stuff, which is even more exciting because uh, the ladies there, um, I think they're a little bit more interesting. I think so too. And certainly women have been portrayed a certain way in spy novels and spy movies. We tend to think of them as the femme fatales, these sexy sirens that are able to get secrets. Uh, And of course, that is not the reality. And so for me, it was a real pleasure to dig into the history of this group of women who started out during World War II as espionage agents and then worked their way up and had these long careers at the CIA. And it's surprising what their role was, because, of course, we tend to think of spies a certain way. But the work these women were doing is is quite different than how we think of women in espionage. And so to be able to really dig into what their histories were like, what their roles were, the operations they were part of, it gives us a different view on history. I've got to throw in here because one of my favorite posters of all time actually runs with that horrible stereotype that uh, that you just mentioned and uh, it's one of I think it's a British one uh, World War II poster I don't know if people people might uh, not recognize it but if you do go online and google it it's a poster of a woman laying you know this beautifully dressed woman laying on this like chaise lounge thing and at the bottom uh, surrounded by officers and at the bottom it says keep mum she's not so dumb mm. <laughs> Yes. I mean, I love spy movies and novels, too. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, But certainly when we dig into the real history of what women were doing in intelligence during World War II and during the Cold War, reality looks quite a bit different than that fantasized, fictionalized version of history. So um, when when you've written the book, you've based it on a, a handful of really exceptional, exceptional women. What made you choose them specifically? You know, it wasn't easy because to my surprise, there were so many women that were part of intelligence operations during World War II. And this actually came as a bit of a shock to me because we've heard about the roles of women during World War II, of course, in many books and movies. Um, But to hear of women who are intelligence officers in American intelligence in particular was new to me. I hadn't heard those stories. And so to be able to research them took quite a bit of time. Um, These women weren't easy to find. And of course, I was able to write this book because they had passed away. And so I was able to get their files declassified from the CIA. Um, But there were so many women to choose from. And so what I did was I picked women who had started during World War II and had these long careers throughout this Cold War in the CIA. And I chose women who came from many different backgrounds. So there's a single mom of three. There's a woman who's married. There's a woman who grew up on reservations in South Dakota. Um, They all came from different places. One of them has a PhD in archaeology. They have all different education levels. Some of them only graduated from high school. Um, But it by looking at all of these different backgrounds, we can really see how they were able to bring their own unique skills to their intelligence operations. And this is a big theme of the book. What we see is that during World War II, you have William Donovan, who's considered the father of American intelligence. 
And he believed that bringing in a diverse group of intelligence officers was critical to operations. And he says this, he says that having racial diversity, bringing in women is important. And so he hired many different women during World War II from all of these different backgrounds. And they ended up having these very long careers in intelligence, um, probably much to the surprise of administrators in Washington who expected them to go back home after the war was over. I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about these women. The reason being is, you know, here in Britain, Poland, in Europe, we generally talk about people like Christine Granville, Odette Samson people who have had books literally written about them. But this for me is new, learning about women, American women, who are part of, of, of this whole movement. And it's really exciting to finally get our teeth in and learn a little bit more about them. So let's talk about Adelaide Hawkins. So before the CIA, what was she doing during World War II as part of the OSS? So Addie joined the OSS. She was hired by William Donovan, and she became chief of the communications center in Washington, D.C. She was from a small town in the South. She was a single mom of three. Um, Well, actually, she was married at first during World War II, so I should go back for a minute there. Um, But her husband ended up being sent overseas. They had a, a rocky relationship, and he ended up abandoning the family, essentially, And so what we see is that Addie during this time really struggled because she had to somehow keep her family together while also having this very important job. Uh, She ended up putting her kids in boarding school during the last years of the war. And we we really see her personal struggles during that time. Um, But her, her role was important and she was able to work her way up the ranks, becoming very important, becoming um, part of designing spy gear. And there's some wonderful um, innovations that she came up with. One of those that I really enjoyed is this compact. And it looks just like any woman's compact with a mirror inside. But when it's held at a certain angle, a code is revealed. Um, And so she came up with a lot of different spy gear like this. She was key in making secret communications between agents and officers in the field and being able to get them transmitted back to Washington, D.C. And she also worked closely with several of the other women that I talk about in the book. Um, But during all of this time, her, her real goal, what she really wants, is a position overseas And this is not easy because nobody wants to send the single mom across the world by herself. Um, And even as her kids get older, she still struggles to to obtain this. Um, And a part of the other part, you know, the other difficulty for her is that nobody in her family even knew that she was working for the CIA. They thought that she was just a secretary. Um, And so when she finally does get that overseas assignment, it is just an incredible accomplishment for her. She's really able to prove herself in the field and it helps her career. It helps her really work her way up in the ranks. Were female OSS agents ever deployed behind the lines in France in the same way as the SOE were? They were. And in the book, I speak about the experiences of one woman named Jane Burrell. And she was a housewife working on a dairy farm in New York when she decided to apply for the U.S. government. And and her application to the government, there is this funny line where it says, if you are willing to travel, specify occasionally or constantly. And she put the very least amount of travel. She did not expect to be being sent overseas at all. Um, But Jane had incredible experience in education. This was a woman who had graduated from Smith College with a major in French. She was fluent in several languages and she traveled extensively. And so she ends up being promoted quite quickly to this elite section of the OSS that was known as X2. This was a group of counterintelligence officers. And so Jane was first sent to London where she learned some basic training with UK intelligence. And in the book, I really enjoyed talking about how inept American intelligence was in these early years. We really see them struggle. There are so many mistakes that are being made. They're trying to learn from the UK and they're just constantly getting in trouble. (laughs) And the British frequently say that they do not want to have the Americans with them because they just know that they're going to screw everything up. Um, But the one exception they make are with X2, with these X2 officers of which Jane is one. And these were really considered the elite. And so Jane is, after London, she's then sent to Normandy. 
And there, this group of officers is tracking down German stay behind agents. They then approach them and get them to work for the allies. You can imagine that this was very dangerous work to be doing. And when we look at the transcripts of some of these conversations that Jane was having with these uh, German officers, we see that she was able to approach her work in this very skilled manner. She was able to really make friends with these men. Um, You know, sometimes they used bribery as well, um, but it was really this mix of being able to manipulate and influence them to get them to work for the allies. And they particularly targeted men that were not German and that did not have very strong moral compunction about working for the Nazis. And so in the book, I talk about her work with one Spaniard named Juan Frutos, um, who was in France. And so she ends up having this relationship with him, which was very volatile. He did not want to work for the Allies. He was terrified. There were many times that he just tried to disappear and did not want to be found. Um, But Jane kept pushing him. And she ended up writing out these messages from Juan Frutos back to the Nazis. And these messages became longer and longer in length, and they were complete misdirection. They were all about getting the Germans to send troops and U-boats to locations where the Allies were reportedly, but in actuality, they were not. Um, And so these operations ended up having an enormous influence on the course of the war. And we see that for Jane, um, it, it just made her become passionate about intelligence so that even after the war, she continued on. She continued on as an officer. Jane is a badass. (laughs) <laughs> yes, she is. And, you know, especially we see that even after the war, she is continuing to take risks. And there is this real fear that the Germans are hiding treasure across Europe as a means to return to power. And so there's this wonderful section of the book where Jane is essentially conducting a treasure hunt across Europe. And she's using her interrogations with former German intelligence officers to track down artwork and treasure. Um, And in one castle in the Italian Alps, they managed to come across sacks of gold. Uh, It's just an exciting moment in the book where they're able to finally come across this treasure. They bring it back to the CIA station in Munich and begin to count it. And to their surprise, it is what today is worth millions of dollars in gold coins. Um, And so operations like this were very important in keeping the Nazis from returning to power. Um, But ultimately, it ends up leading to Jane's downfall. And this is a section of the book that is is very sad because what we see is that um, at the end of 1947, Jane is being sent to Brussels where she's working closely with the Monuments Men. And of course, as you know, the Monuments Men was this group that were intent on saving artwork across Europe. And at the end of the war, they are doing much as what Jane is doing. They're they're trying to find all of this lost artwork that was looted by the Nazis. And so Jane is working closely with them because she's able to give them intelligence on German art dealers and intelligence officers that she had worked with during the war. Um, And so she's returning from Brussels to Paris, where she is working out of the CIA station when the plane crashes. Everyone on board is killed, including Jane. Um, And because the CIA was officially formed just four months earlier, this makes Jane the first CIA officer to die in service to her country. Now, unfortunately, Jane has still not received a star in the CIA's memorial wall. And this is a memorial wall that honors all CIA officers that have fallen in the line of duty. And it includes many officers that died like Jane did on commercial aircraft that crashed. Um, So she is certainly eligible for this star. And in the book, I provide conclusive evidence of why this is and why she should be included. So my, my hope is that this book will also push the CIA to finally acknowledge the sacrifice that Jane made. Before Chris asks his next question, I've got to say, I swear you tweeted about this and I retweeted it. It might have been a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, I, I know I tweeted about it uh, a while back. Um, it's something that, you know, I've really been working on. I've submitted all this documentation to the CIA and it's it's just so frustrating 
You know, it's, I, I do as much as I can to get it out there, but there's so much bureaucracy in government isn't there. And it's, it's hard to get the right people to, to change this, to make institutional changes is, is just difficult under any circumstance. But I feel like for Jane, there is this element of sexism in it. And that if she were a man, she would have been included long ago. And it's only because she was a woman, even though she was the first CI officer to die in service um, that, you know, we keep struggling to get her recognition. Well, let's hope somebody from uh, the government, American government or the CIA is listening to uh, hopefully give us a bit of a hand because that would be a, that would be an amazing accomplishment. Hmm, yes. And it does quite lead in quite nicely for the next question, which was, um, I mean, obviously you get this idea that I know in the, the British military, you had that kind of lads, lads and men doing it all and women, are, you know, they're over there and men do it better, apparently, in inverted commas. Was it was it very much a sort of male dominated CIA? And what, what were the conditions for women at the time working for the CIA? I think what's surprising is that it wasn't a male dominated CIA, that there were many female officers that were working in intelligence because they were hired during World War II. You have this really strong group of women um, that then went on and worked in these early intelligence operations, even after the CIA was formed. But the problem for them was, is that they were not getting the same pay and promotions as the men they worked alongside. So although they were doing similar work, and in some cases, really extraordinary work, as I talk about in the book, they weren't being recognized for it. And I mean, this isn't surprising, right? I mean, do we really think that women were being treated equally, particularly in the 1950s? Um, So it's not a big surprise. But what is astonishing is what the women did about it. Because there was such a strong group of women, they decided they were going to take the agency on. And they did this in 1953 when Alan Dulles is being brought in as the next director of the CIA. And Dulles was not unexpected. People knew that he was going to become director. Um, But during his swearing in ceremony, he turns to the group of officers around him and he asks if they have any questions and the women are ready for him. They have been waiting for this moment and they immediately begin peppering him with questions. They ask him, what are you going to do about professional discrimination against women in the CIA? Why are women being paid less than men? And they they go after him. And you can imagine that even for a modern workplace, this kind of questioning would be considered bold. Um, But back in the 1950s, it was unheard of for people to act this way. Um, And it's kind of to Dulles' credit, actually, that instead of just immediately shutting down the conversation, he decides that he is going to listen to them. And he is going to start what becomes known as the petticoat panel. This, of course, is a a terrible name for a panel, isn't it? It was just a joking name that was given to it by men. Um, But the panel itself is quite serious. And it's started by this group of women who is known as the wise gals, as I talk about in the book. And the women that I describe um, in the book are all part of this panel, which is another reason I chose them, because they knew each other. They were friends and they were part of this panel together. And on the panel, they decide they're going to document exactly the work women are doing at the agency and how they're being paid less and promoted not as often, as well as look at how women are leaving the agency because of conditions. Um, And the panel becomes this real bonding experience for the women because they're all gathering together and sharing their personal experience as officers of what they've gone through. And they make up these kind of amazing lists about all of the comments they've heard from men about how women aren't as good as male officers. Um, And they just go through every horrible comment they've heard. They share all of their personal stories of what it's been like in the field. And these are women that have all worked across the globe, um, but haven't really had this chance to be able to describe the discrimination they've received. Um, So the panel itself is an important turning point because although male administrators are very quick to dismiss the actions of these women, what happens is that the women themselves decide to really bond together to change things. 
Um, and from the panel, they begin to get promotions. They begin to really prove themselves. And we see women such as Eloise Page um, become the most powerful woman at the agency. She becomes the head of scientific and technical operations. Um, and this is quite a leap when you consider that she began as a secretary during World War II. Um, so certainly the panel has an enormous influence and it's part of making the CIA what it ultimately becomes, what it is today, an agency that is half women and that has a woman, Avril Haines, at its helm. So post-war, things completely, they really, really change. So during the Second World War, these women are fighting against the Germans, against the Nazis, and then the war ends and along comes another problem, which is the Soviets. And that's a whole other level of different challenges. So can you talk us through what happened uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war? So most of this book is rooted in these officers' operations against the Soviets during the Cold War. So, you know, the beginning, we're looking at World War II, where they're beginning to learn these espionage operations. They falter, they make many mistakes, and then they begin to hit their stride, although there's certainly many mistakes still to be made. Um, during operations against the Soviets. Um, so the women are placed in, in several different spots across the globe. One of them is Mary Hutchinson, and she had a PhD in archaeology. She was fluent in multiple languages. She served in World War II as an intelligence officer. But then when she applied for the CIA, she was at first only given the job of secretary. And She was incredibly upset by this. She said, quote, that is a waste of my abilities. And so she was then brought in as an officer. And so she was stationed in Germany. And as part of their operations against the Soviets, they wanted to create these spy networks that would let them know what type of weaponry the Soviets were working on. And of course, a a better inside view of what was happening, particularly in Eastern Europe. And of course, we can see many associations with today, uh, with our own Western relations with Russia. And much of this can be rooted in this time period. So we see that Mary Hutchinson worked very closely with a spy named Arati. And Arati had identified Ukrainian nationalists as an ideal Soviet spy network, essentially. Um, And so this ends up being the first alliance between the United States and the Ukrainians. And at first, administrators in Washington are very critical of Mary's reports. They say that Ukraine lacks a nationalist mindset, that it can never be a long-term ally, um, which is pretty laughable when we look, of course, at today's politics, because that's not at all what happened. Um, And so there's many mistakes that happened during this time, but Mary does end up growing the spy network. And what we see is that in the 1950s, she has this web of double agents that are operating in Ukraine. And it's because of their espionage that they're able to uncover a biological weapons facility that's located uh, in Soviet Ukraine, as well as other weaponry operations that they're able to unveil. Um, So her work ends up being very critical during the Cold War. Do do they have much to do with uh, werewolf hunting as well in Germany? Oh, Sounds yes. <laughs> yes. So I, I talk a bit about that in the book, particularly uh, with Jane's work and as well as Eloise, who ends up being after the war. So she's the secretary for Donovan during World War II. And Eloise Page is such an interesting officer because she is really the last person you would ever expect was a spy. This is a Southern lady. She wore white gloves and pearls. She always looked a certain way. She was very small. She was a small woman. Um, But she could be fierce. And we see that after the war, she moves up from being a secretary to the first female um, leading a station post-war. And she works out of Brussels, um, where I, I detail many mistakes that are made during that time, particularly as a result of bribery and and just, you know, American intelligence is still very young at that time. Um, But there is this concerted effort to track down Germans, uh, particularly Nazi intelligence officers that had been part of these operations. Um, And it's for Donovan, it is it's a a personal, a personal operation for him. We really see that he is very committed 
to finding these men and women and bringing them to trial. And actually he ends up playing a role in Nuremberg and he ends up, I, I talk quite a bit about that part of history in the book as well. And so tracking down these men and women um, is, is essential to the women's operations during that time. And it's, you know, it's interesting to see how there are officers that they had no idea, you know, that they had even worked with, that Americans had been bribing, had been working closely with. And then it ends up being that, you know, some of these men were even more repulsive than they could have ever imagined. Um, so certainly operations like that were were important. So coming back to Mary Hutchinson, what was she actually doing in Tokyo? So she was sent to Japan in the early 1950s. And this is some of my favorite parts of her diaries and letters, because at first she is in this really small town in Japan that she just loves. She just, it's so beautiful. And then they are sent, her and her husband, who's also a CIA officer, is sent to Tokyo. And at first her reaction is just she's so angry. She's so annoyed. She doesn't want to be there in this big crowded city. And we really see that in her diary entries during that time. Um, And amusingly, it's when she finds this bookshop neighborhood that she ends up really falling in love with the city. Um, But part of the reason for why she was so annoyed in Tokyo was not just because it was a large city and she preferred the country. Part of the reason was the frustration with her work during that time. So just as Mary was working with Ukrainian nationalists uh, in Germany at the end of World War II, in the early 1950s in Tokyo, they are also seeking out a Japanese spy network. And so they're looking at particular political parties in Japan, making alliances with these men and women and then using them as a spy network to keep an eye on China and North Korea. And so what we see in 1950 is that many of her reports are looking at troops that are amassing on the border, and they have intelligence that shows that North Korea is certain to attack its southern neighbor. Um, these reports are sent to Washington. And you know it's important to remember that um, for a lot of these operations, this is intelligence gathering. This is essential espionage. And I, I make a big distinction in the book between these operations and paramilitary operations of the CIA, which of course have been written about many times in the past because they are such remarkable failures. There's Cuba, there's Guatemala, there's Iran. There are these horrible paramilitary operations that have had Uh, enormous effects. Um, But the women were not involved in paramilitary branch of the CIA. Um, They were involved in these classic espionage operations that they had really learned and honed their craft during World War II. And so their role is collecting intelligence so that it can be sent back to Washington and hopefully inform policy in a way that, that gives insight, that gives really needed insight and value to what decisions will be made. Um, back in Washington, D.C. And so the women don't have control, of course, over how troops are going to be sent or or what the final impact will be. All they can do is give the best intelligence that they are able to gather. And so for for the network in Tokyo, Mary's not there for a long period of time, but what we see is that she's able to give very effective intelligence showing how China is working with the Soviets during this time and what is about to happen uh, in North Korea. Um, And it's unfortunate that in Washington, they are very dismissive of this. They do not believe the CIA. There is a real feeling that the CIA is is not a, a useful partner. And a lot of this stems back to World War II, where we see that the emergence of the CIA as this civilian intelligence agency rankled military intelligence officials who felt as if they were competing with the CIA. Um, And I go into some detail about how this worked and what the feelings were, and and particularly some of the politics with Donovan, um, the father of American intelligence, and how he grappled and sometimes made things worse uh, because of his actions. Um, So Mary does not spend long in Tokyo, but we certainly see this continued uh, effort that occurs not just with her, but across the globe. So all of these women are working at building these spy networks. And so we have 
um, Eloise, who is building a Soviet spy network, and we have Mary in Japan, and then we have Elizabeth Sudmeyer, who's building a spy network in the Middle East. And all of these sources are about gaining intelligence and bringing them back to headquarters in Washington, D.C. What was the closed city of Lake, here goes, Ityash, and uh, what did the CIA do about it? So closed city, City 40, uh, was this region where the Soviets in 1946 began a Soviet nuclear testing facility. And they wanted to keep this quiet. They didn't want anyone to discover it. And so they did not have any storage tanks for nuclear waste when they began testing in this region. And instead, they were dumping radioactive waste directly into this lake. Now, it took a few years for the CIA to uncover what was happening in this region. But we see from the early 1950s, 1950, 1950, 1951, that they've identified this closed city. And this wasn't easy, as you can imagine. This is a secret city that doesn't occur on any map. You can't Google it, of course, not that you could Google in the 1950s. Um, but there's no road signs. Everyone that works there has to remain in the city under very secretive conditions. Um, so to uncover this was not easy. And it took quite a bit of work from Eloise Page's spy network to even find out that the city existed and where testing was occurring. Um, and this is part of her work looking at nuclear weaponry. And we see that this becomes very important after World War II to discover where testing is occurring and what weaponry um, will become part of the Cold War in the future years ahead. So as they're watching this closed city, um, they end up having these spy planes. And I talk about the development of spy planes in the book and how it helps them keep an eye as well as the spy network that they have with the Soviets. Um, and then in 1957, we see that there is this horrible nuclear disaster that occurs. And this is really because of shoddy construction. They did eventually put in storage tanks in this area. However, they were built hastily. And there is, as you can imagine, things go horribly wrong. Um, and so after this disaster, which is bigger than Chernobyl, it's the worst nuclear accident to date. Uh, what happens is, is that the CIA is watching, um, but they don't know what to do. They really grapple with what they should do next because the Soviets are not able to admit that this was an accident at all. They're just saying, oh, this is Aurora Borealis. These are just beautiful lights, natural phenomenon. Um, but the CIA knows better. Um, and they make what is a, a really intense decision. It's, it's one that's hard to justify by any means, but they decide not to alert the world to this horrible nuclear disaster and instead to keep it a secret. And they do this because they don't want to lose their surveillance in the region. And they know that if they announce that they know this disaster has occurred, that then they'll, they, they may not be able to identify where the next nuclear testing facility is. So they decide it's better to just keep an eye on what's happening in that region. And in the book, I contrast this with what happened with Sputnik during the same era. So this is all happening in 1957. And with Sputnik, we also see that Eloise Page, who has this large spy network um, with Soviet scientists, she is able to predict Sputnik's um, apogee, it's, a, uh, its launch perfectly. She knows exactly the date. She knows where it will be launched. She knows when it can be seen. And uh, nobody at D in D.C., none of the her administrators in Washington will believe her. They all say, oh, no, you're all just you're just getting this from your spy network. And how do we know we can trust them? Um, and Eloise really wants to warn the public. She wants to let people know that this is coming because she knows that Sputnik will will cause fear that people will be worried that this is happening. Um, and she is immediately shot down. And Sputnik, of course, is launched on October 4th, 1957, which is the exact date that she had predicted. Um, so it's interesting to look at how, how she was able to find out all about Sputnik and all about the satellite and contrast it with what happened in the closed city, in City 40, um, where everything was hushed up, where they never said anything. Um, they never wanted to warn anyone or have any cleanup effort or, or really cared about the many people that were affected by this horrible disaster. Um, and it, it shows you perhaps the 
the the struggle and the desperation that the CIA had during that time that they weren't able to make um, what probably was the the right decision. We're currently discussing and talking about something that's quite Europe centric, and we tend to be quite Eurocentric or American centric. But there's a lot more going on at this time, isn't there? Because there's uh, it's hotting up in the Middle East. Tell us a little bit about what's happening there. So in the book, I talk about Elizabeth Sudmeyer, who was stationed in the Middle East. And Elizabeth Sudmeyer is such an interesting person because she grew up on reservations in South Dakota. She served in World War II. She then was hired as a secretary at the CIA, and she worked her way up, went to junior officer training, and becomes an officer where she's sent to the Middle East. And in the Middle East at this time, what we see is that there was a lot of grappling for control between the Soviets and the UK and Americans who are all trying to find their own sliver of power in the region. Um, And the Soviets are using this region particularly for weaponry development. And so when Liz is sent there, this is Elizabeth Sudmeyer, who everyone called Liz, um, she is desperate to find out what the Soviets are doing. And so she's part of this group of officers who are stationed in Baghdad. Now, in Baghdad, Liz is able to really bring something to her operations that her other male officers cannot. Um, and that is because she's able to start a spy network using resources that none of them have access to. She does this through a beauty salon and a dress shop. And in both of these places, she goes into these establishments and immediately just makes friends. And she was very good at blending into environments, pretending to be a housewife, pretending to chat with them. She would then find out which of these women had brothers and had husbands who worked with the Soviets. And she found there was one woman whose husband was an engineer who was working with the Soviets. And so she immediately began initiating a friendship with her. She then approached the husband and asked him to work for the allies. And this was done very carefully. You can imagine the risk that Liz was taking to do this because she's essentially asking this man to betray his employers and to share secrets with her. And she does this not just with one family, but with several. And by doing so, she's able to establish this entire network of spies in the Middle East. And by doing this, she's able to create um, an entire database. So they're able to get all of these secret blueprints for Soviet fighter jets, as well as other Soviet weaponry. And this is important at the time because the Americans have little idea of what they're up against. Um, and so Liz's work is able to bring all of this back to Washington so that they can also help design. It can help aid in the design of their own spy planes. Um, Now, Liz's work becomes even more dangerous in 1957 um, and 1958 when there is an uprising in Baghdad and there's a coup. The royal family is executed and military powers take control of the country. Immediately, Americans are being targeted and killed in the region, as well as other Westerners, of course. And the CIA station itself evacuates. Everyone leaves except for Liz. She is the only officer to remain in Baghdad. And she does this. She stays undercover to protect her spy network. Um, You can imagine the risk that she is taking to do this. She is truly risking her own life. Um, But her intelligence ends up being critical because at that time, we see that President Eisenhower decides that in the wake of what's happened in Iraq, he wants to send troops to the region. And he sends them first to Lebanon. This is the first time American troops are sent to the Middle East. Um, And it's actually a a bit of an amusing story in the book because they have no idea what they're doing. They go to Lebanon. They're expecting to be confronted um, by military power. And instead, they land on a beach and are invited into this peaceful beach scene. There are just kids playing. People come up to them, offer them soda. Um, You have all of these troops that land and have no idea what they're doing. Um, So Liz's intelligence back to Washington from inside Baghdad ends up being important and ultimately prevents war because she's able to show them that actually it isn't uh, Lebanon, that there aren't these overarching Soviet powers that have created the situation in Baghdad and that American troops should not be there at all. And so it's really thanks to her and to 
the actions of troops on the ground in Lebanon, that a bigger war does not break out at that time. Um, uh, what's interesting about this is that Liz, of course, has sacrificed so much to do this. Um, and so her CIA station chief, who's a man named Arthur Callahan, decides to nominate her for the Intelligence Medal of Merit. This is a really prestigious honor for American intelligence officers. And in Washington, when they get this nomination, they say, oh, no, this is impossible. We can't have a woman receive this award. This has never happened before. And they immediately reject it. And it takes years of the station chief acting on Liz's behalf for her to finally get this award. Um, and I show a picture of when she's able to accept it in the book. It's this small ceremony that happens in Washington, D.C. It's an important moment for her. Um, it's really a culmination of, of so much of her work and so much of the spy network that she's grown in the Middle East. Um, and she's able to hold this medal for just a few minutes um, because CIA officers do not get to hold their own medals and their own, own honors. Instead, they're all kept in a vault in Washington, D.C., so they can't be discovered. Um, and so she knows that this medal will only see the light of day next uh, after her death. We, we see a lot of change of, in attitudes and a lot of hard work that the, these women women agents are putting in. Is there much change in the way that the CIA treat their agent, treat, treat their female agents through the period? It's an interesting question because there is progress that is made over the decades. And we see that in the way that the women are able to be promoted, come into these positions of power. And then because they have this, they're able to bring other women in after them and create an environment that is more accepting of female officers. Um, but certainly struggles continue and they continue today as well. Um, you know, I talk about the, the, the difficult moments as well as the successes for these women. Um, but it, it certainly takes the efforts of pioneers. And these women all knew that they were pioneers. They knew that they were groundbreakers. And it, it takes the, a group of women like this to then pave the way for the many that come after them. Thanks very much for this, Natalie. It's been really, really interesting. It's something that, like we said earlier, not many people, when you think of spies, you think of James Bond and guys running around blowing stuff up with good looking women to the side. And it's something that I think in your book you explore quite deeply. And it's something that um, I think more people need to be aware of, especially if we can get that star on the wall for uh, for Jane. So um, thanks very much for uh, coming to uh, coming on and talking to us about it. Could you just remind everyone uh, the name of your book and where they can get it from? Uh, the name of the book is Wise Gals, The Spies Who Built the CIA and Changed the Future of Espionage. Um, and it should be available wherever books are sold starting in early February in the UK. And we'll, uh, we'll try and get it onto the uh, History Hack online bookshop. That way we get a small slice of the money. And more importantly, Natalie, as the historian, gets more money and Jeff Bezos can't use it for building spaceships. <laughs> so yeah, people that need the money and deserve the money get the money. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you talking to me today. I enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, it's been great having you on and uh, you have to come on again sometime. Oh, I'd love that. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book